you start off by introducing yourself and tell us how you became a fighter? Uh, Larry Landless. I started off in wrestling, got interested in fighting, and uh, been refing, and then started fighting two years ago. And uh, like you, you were ref tonight. Like, how did how did that all transition take place? I started off uh, with the first pancreation shows in uh, Southern California, refing them and putting them out. Um, went to uh, on someone else's event in the early 90s, and um, they had asked me to ref their event. I volunteered, and then I got a few phone calls from that event for other events. The next thing you know, I was doing all the underground shows in Southern California for the first four years, pretty much all by myself. And then um, eventually, um, a couple years later, I got in touch with um, Terry from King of the Cage, found me at one of the shows and asked me to do his show. I'd done his first show and done several shows, a whole bunch of shows after that. And it was at one of the King of the Cage shows that I got discovered by John McCarthy and started refing in the UFC. So overall, I've repped over 600 no hold barred fights and um, decided to put the refing on hold for a while and started fighting competitively at 39 I started competing I'm 41 now I'm gonna fight a couple more and then probably go back to refing full time what's it like to like start at the age of 39 I mean some of these guys who fight 17, 18 we're starting to train like did you feel like you were at a disadvantage yeah I did I, I let my best years pass me by I, I wish I would have started right at 28 when it first came out but uh I, you know, like I said, I got involved promoting shows and right away, and then I started refing them. And uh, in fact, I went to one underground fight, prepared to fight, had an opponent, and the promoter paid me extra to ref the fight instead of fighting it. So I, you know, switched hats and refed it. That's usually how I did things. What's the whole underground fight like? <laughs> Back in the day, it was pretty cool because even though it was underground, it, Nobody cared, you know, Just we just put it out, we advertised it, and it was great. I mean, now there's a problem, obviously, I mean, with the commission about to make things legal. I think everyone should kind of lay low, but, uh, you know, that's how we all got our start. I mean, in my first, my first paid refereeing gig was Rico Rodriguez's first fight, uh, Fabiano Ijas. Dean Listers. I mean, we all started, you know, our professional careers all at the same time. Not only them, I'd rep a whole bunch of people on the ground that had, uh, you know, went on the big time. We fought in Pride. I fought, I ref guys on underground shows. We fought in King of the Cage, UFC. You know, all kinds of shows all over the world. I mean, we we all knew each other back in the day. Did you ever fight? No, I've only refereed in the UFC. I've uh, I refereed UFC number 34 all the way through uh, 46, and uh, I'm on kind of hold right now. I'm I might be going back after I retire from uh, from fighting. You know, it's a matter of the athletic commission uh, permitting me, and I'm ready to go if they ask me. Where do you see the business going? Like well, we just did a show in uh, Aloha Bowl in uh, last week in Hawaii, a K1 fight. Even though it's primarily kickboxing, they had uh, a MMA bout with Henzo Gracie and BJ Penn, and it seemed to go pretty well. It didn't quite sell out, but it was still high numbers. And um, I think an NHB bout with some big names can sell that place out. I've seen the possibility. Um, like I said, it was primarily a K1 event, kickboxing. If if it's a pure MMA event, it, it'll probably go bigger. Um, how did you? What, what was the training regimen like for you as a fighter? Like how, how did you? Wow. Like? First fight, I kind of just winged it. I trained, you know, did my thing, and then I, I wasn't as prepared for that first fight. On the second fight that I put out, I uh, was a little more physically prepared trained a little smarter the third fight I did um, I was spent too much time in the weight room and not enough time doing any cardio and uh, I barely got through that fight I'm 3-0 and undefeated but uh, that last fight you know woke me up I need to really be in shape before I take another fight so I'm gonna spend more time with cardio and 
smart overall training. <laughs> oh, unions, wow. Um, I don't know. I really don't. I mean, there's so many people. I, I know so many promoters and promotions and fighters, and I've been all over the world doing this now, and I know a lot of people. And one thing I notice is that 90% of the people out there just they just want to score the winning touchdown for Notre Dame. You know, nobody wants to block. When people come in with an attitude of, you know, let's do this together and put the Eagles aside, and I think things will get done on all levels, not just as a union, but but on all levels, promotion. I think it'll be better overall. There's been some, you know, I, King of the Cage. I feel is a pretty honest promotion as well as Rumble on the Rock, UFC, all those shows I work for. I know some shows that have done a few little shady things that I, you know, I kind of shy away from them. What can a promotion do, like something shady you've seen? I won't mention no names, but I ref the fight, and during the fight there was communication going on between the two fighters as to what move to do next, roll, uh, mount, um, give me the arm bar type of stuff. It was obviously a work. Um, they were trying to pass it off pretty good. They were making contact with each other. But um, I stopped the fight, brought it to the promoter's attention. He, he obviously knew about it. I had mentioned that I wasn't gonna ref this unless it was legit. The promoter said, go for real. And from that point on, they appeared to be a real fight. Otherwise, I would have walked off. <clears throat> what do you feel is like the biggest challenge in this industry, like for the fighters? Wow, uh, the fighters, um, they need to, uh, you know, there's, there's, like I say, they get promise or they think there's a lot more to it than it really is. And the reality is, you know, <clears throat> like fighters come in thinking they're going to make so much money right off the bat just for fighting. And I could just tell by ticket sales, where, the, where it's at, you know, there, a lot of cost goes towards promotion, the event, the venue, you know, some venues take a large chunk of the money. So there's very little left for all the people working the show and then the production costs and then the fighters. Um, people see a sold out arena and they think wow they should pay the fighters more but I see both sides of that argument what needs to get done right now is that fighters need to really get involved in promotion they need to you know make events bigger once events are sold out get bigger get bigger venues there will be more money but they can't just train and then expect it to happen unfortunately uh, ideally they would like for that to happen but Realistically, they need to get involved in promoting their own events, their own fights, their fighters' fights, and make it make those ticket sales happen consistently. I mean, right now we're using half of this arena, and I think we hold uh, 4,000, 4,500 maybe, and we max it out. We should be using this whole stadium. We should be close to 6,000 here, and you know that comes directly down to each fighter, not just one or two, but each fighter. There's some fighters that promote the heck out of themselves and they get a kickback and you know they deserve it other fighters do little to nothing and expect a lot so they all got to get involved what is your family like wife and children think about <laughs> well my wife and i are now separated going through divorce um that's why i got into fighting i was just kind of sitting around doing nothing for a while decided you know what i'm if i don't do this now i'm not going to do it so i gave me something positive to do so that aside you know, i'm pretty happy with the way things are working out i'm I'm doing things that I should be doing, I should have been doing all along. Um, I have no children, so it's pretty easy on me. It's all up to me as to how much I train, what time I come home, and all that. And I don't have to answer to nobody at this point, so it's pretty cool. Now, what's the stress like for a ref in like a UFC match? I, I've never stressed. You know, I've, I made a really big controversial call one time with a, with a fighter with a, at one of the UFC fights, UFC 45. And the whole place just, you know, hated my guts, it seemed. But, you know, I ref the fight two fights later against uh, 
Matt Lindland and uh, Nico Vitali, and I, you know, I, I had to put all that aside and just focus on my job. And I know I did a good job on that one. I made a mistake during the Baroni fight in the sense that there was miscommunication between he and I, and um, you know that that was a, you know, I still feel bad about that, but you know it's resolved as far as he and I are concerned. We've talked, apologized, and you know, but as far as stress, no, I I. I could put it aside in a minute and refocus and start start fresh. What exactly happened with the Bruni fight? Well, there was a miscommunication between the two of us. I had thought he he had been taken down and mounted. I told him to protect himself, and he said something. I didn't know quite what he said, so I questioned what he was asking. I said, "Do you you know you want out? In other words, you want me to stop this?" And he said uh, something to the effect of. Uh, I thought he said okay, okay, but he was telling me he was that I'm okay, I'm okay. But I heard okay, okay, so I was kind of shocked. So I asked again. I got really close and I said, "You want out? You want out?" I asked twice, and then he said, "You know, either no, no, or yeah, yeah." You know, I just heard something. I stopped it, and you know, then we had it. He, he kind of uh, he kind of pushed me, and he was upset, and there was a big old controversy, and. You know, it was, it was a real mess, and once again, you know, I, I wish I could take that back, but it happened, you know. It's one of those things that I just, you know, it's time to move on. We That happened uh, two years ago. It happened uh, two weeks before my first fight, and, um, you know, it's time to you know, just focus on, get, get ready for the next things in our lives, put that behind us. Who do you feel is the best fighter in the world right now? <laughs> Actually, there's some guy that not too many people know about. He's 145 pounds. His knees are shot to hell, so he should be retired. But um, he's phenomenal. He has not shown what he could do. If this guy would have lived out his career as a heavyweight, he'd be the most successful fighter in the world. That's Charlie Valencia. I've seen this guy. This guy is amazing. But once again, nobody has seen what he could do. He is just, he's, a, he's incredible. Incredible. Yeah, I gotta get rolling. I gotta get dressed.